Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the session hybrid flexible programming and instruction, uh, the guidance. Yes. Uh, joining us today is Destiny Simpson and Jen Fanick. Um, we have them joining us today. We appreciate everyone taking the time out to um, join the session. And I'll turn it over to Jen and Destiny. Yeah, great. Hello, everyone. I'm Jen Vanek, and I'm here with my colleague, Destiny Simpson. We're going to talk about emerging practices for high flex and adult ed. Um, so I am director of digital learning and research at the Ed Tech Center at World Education. And I'll let Destiny, Destiny, go ahead and go to the next slide and you can introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Destiny Simpson. I uh, live and work in Pennsylvania, but I also have the opportunity to uh, work with the Ed Tech Center and with Jen on uh, some of the projects they're doing, including the HyFlex project that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. So um, the Ed Tech Center at World Education focuses on helping programs like yours um, boost equitable access to technology-rich instruction and um, we just we really try to provide free resources and provide pr free PD whenever possible. So I encourage you to check out um, our site and sign up for our newsletter so you can find find opportunities um, for for P PD and resources. Um, and then as part of that work, um, we facilitate the Ideal Consortium, which is a group of state level leaders who all share the goal of boosting access to quality and equitable distance blended hybrid and high flex education. And um, the high flex course that you're going to hear about and the high flex guide that you're going to hear about. Um, come out of our work with ideal consortium member states. Um, you can see on the map here, maybe maybe your state is a current member or a former member, um, but feel free to reach out if you have more questions about that. Okay, so we're going to start off with a poll. Um, could Destiny, go ahead, since you designed this aspect, go ahead and Okay, so uh, we'd love to get a sense of where your uh, comfort level or experience is and knowledge with HyFlex. And so um, in the chat, uh, you may have to scroll up and I'll put it in there again. Uh, you can um, click on the link and then respond to the poll. If you have your cell phone though, you can also uh, use your camera feature and uh, scan the little QR code, which is that kind of black square thing in the upper right hand corner. Great, so it looks like some people are responding. We'll give you another minute or so, and I will put the link in the chat one more time in case people are just logging in. Good, well, it's exciting to hear that we have uh, quite a few people in here that are very new to HyFlex. And so we hope by the end of the session, you have a greater understanding of what HyFlex is and um, some resources that can help support you with that. So I'm gonna. Yeah, so ahead of, ahead of time here, I'm gonna give you a chance to shoot this QR code. There, there are a number of resources that you'll hear about during this webinar and Destiny has actually already organized them nicely into this Padlet. So you can catch the link in the chat or shoot this QR code if you wanna just have it open on your phone. But we'll be referring to these things as we go along. So our agenda for today, basically we're gonna introduce you to the concept of high flex, um, talk about some of the benefits, give you some resources and then show you some strategies um, to help you um, implement HyFlex or learn more about HyFlex. And then we'll have some time for questions and, and closing thoughts at the end. Oh, so they, uh, oh, thanks Destiny for chatting the link again. Okay, so let's get started. Um, HyFlex was first written about um, by a scholar named Brian Beatty, who's at the University of California, San Francisco. And he was using HyFlex with his secondary or his, um, his post-secondary ed students because they were, he was teaching in a professional program and he noticed that a lot of students couldn't commit to attending either in-person or online. Um, so he came up with the most flexible possible combination of the different modes of instruction, a hybrid. So he, he offered learning both online 
and face-to-face, and then flexible, meaning students had a lot of t- choice about whether they could be online or in-person. And um, so we we learned much from um, Dr. Beatty and his course, um, or sorry, his book, um, which may, Destiny might have chatted, I'm not sure, but it, um, we can we can get that to you. If, oh, it's right here. The link is right here. Um, and decided that um, because of what was happening during the pandemic, there were already programs that were wading into this because they had started a practice of virtual live instruction or live remote or synchronous instruction. Um, so we wanted to basically explore what was going on and come up with some of um, just descriptions of effective practice. So just to break this down a little bit more, there are three modes that we're talking about. In person, that's regular in a regular classroom with the teacher standing up in front, as you can see in this circle on the left, and then online. And then within that synchronous, students could either be chiming in by logging in like through Zoom while the the in-class session is happening, or students could learn online asynchronously after the fact. So it's really this combination of choosing the space, either in person or online, and then choosing the time, either at the same time or synchronous or online asynchronous afterward. Um, So as I said, we were really curious um, about what was going on in adult education programs because the pandemic had led so many people to using live remote instruction. And people were talking about how that is high flex. And we knew a little bit about Dr. Beatty's work and, and really wanted to understand if programs were using the full extent of hybrid, which is in that diagram in the slide I just showed. But before we get into more descriptions about what's happening in adult ed, I want to just give an overview of the principles of HyFlex. So what's most important is that these four things are evident in HyFlex. Learners need to have choice, and that's about place or timing. They need, and the instruction that happens, um, either synchronous online, in person, or asynchronous online, needs to be equivalent. It doesn't need to be exactly the same thing, but it should cover the same learning objectives and give some approximation of the different types of activities that happen. So that people, whether they're making a choice to be in person or participating asynchronously online, can learn the same thing and um, that the way that they're learning is equivalent. Um, BD also writes about how important it is for teachers to consider reusability when they're making um, instructional resources so that they can use something in their asynchronous online work that that that's being used in their in-class work so you don't they basically he recommends not setting yourself up so you have to recreate three things um, in order to teach in those three different modes. And then the, of course, accessibility, how how all of these materials needed to be designed with accessibility in mind. So um, I probably have talked about the next slides as I've gone, but let's just recap. So um, going forward, um, again, learner choice is um, provide meaningful alternative participation modes and enable students to choose um, whether or not they wanna be in person or online. Um, then with respect to equivalency, make sure that they can learn um, in similar ways or they're learning similar things, but in different ways. So for example, here you see in person, a small group discussion and complete a Google doc as a group on Zoom. They could be in a Zoom breakout room and still working on that same Google doc with the people sitting in the classroom. And then for those who can't make it to class during that specific time, they could use a discussion board instead of having the Zoom breakout or small room discussion and complete the Google Doc in individually. Um, so, th- you know, they're they're all learning the same thing and they're learning them in equivalent ways, not the exactly the same way. Then with respect to reusability, repurposing artifacts and these different learning activities is really important. So what could this look like? Well, let's say you do... Um, you, you, a, t- a teacher is teaching a synchronous class and they might record themselves teaching it so that they could pick up that video and put it into the LMS and then they would be able to show the learners who choose to learn at a different time. 
Um, then with respect to accessibility, um, paying attention, just ma making sure that programs um, have a sense of learner access to te technologies, um, how they might make use of the technologies available in the program, the actual technologies that are available to them as teachers, and then making sure that they're pre-teaching how to use these di the digital tools that they know that they're gonna wanna use so that te learners actually do have choice and can participate equivalently um, because they understand how to use the technologies that are gonna be required. So essentially all three modes leave to equivalent learning outcomes. It's, that's what's most important that it's, you know, the, the online asynchronous doesn't just turn out to be the neglected, um, I don't know, mode of instruction, that it too is just as rich and meaningful in, as, as a learning opportunity as what happens in class. So at this point, Destiny is going to show you a video um, about what this of this in action. And so while that's happening, pay particular attention to how the teacher by Haas, who is our partner in this work, describe gives instructions to both the in person and the online people and people. All right. Welcome back. So let me explain this next activity. This is called story sequencing. Sequencing means to put in order in the correct, in the correct time order. Okay? This story is called How to Make Toast. Like the bread, toast. Okay? You are to put them in the correct order first. Okay? And then you will write out the instructions. Okay? So see, here are the words for you, okay? So if everybody can see it, okay? These are the words that you will use to write down your instructions, okay? So put, take, and then here I give you one here, spread the butter, one and spread the jam, okay? Wait. It's the last one. Eat and enjoy. Eat and enjoy. Okay. And press, down. press down. Okay. So make sure you write these words down so you remember. Okay. For in person, let me explain what you will do. Okay. You're gonna work with a partner. Okay. Yes. So let's find a partner for you guys. So let's see. You two work together. You three. Okay. Please work together. Okay. You two work together. And then you two. No. Okay. Each group, each pair will receive an envelope, okay? In your envelope, you have pictures, okay? Little pictures. You need to put these pictures in the correct order, okay? So this, everybody will have the same story, okay? So Sandra can help you. You just look at the images, okay? Oh, yes. Look at the pictures. Okay, first you put the pictures in the correct order, and then on a piece of paper, write down the instructions on how to make toast using these words, okay? But also using the, the sequence words, okay? Like first, okay, maybe second, Yes, okay, good, yeah. So, 
Open it up. Look at the pictures together with your group, with your partner. Put the pictures in the correct order. And then on another piece of paper, write down instructions on how to make toast, okay? These words will help you. So, online, I'm gonna give you a link to the images. You guys will work together to complete the same activity, okay? So, everyone online, can you see these pictures? Yes. Good, okay. These pictures are not in the correct order, <laughs> okay? What you need to do, okay, you can click and drag the pictures in the correct number, okay? So you have number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, okay? So you guys work together and put the pictures in the correct order, okay? When you finish, you need to click first in the shot. Yeah, so you click first. You hold. You click with your mouse, and then you drag it. Okay. So you guys will work together to do this. Okay. When you finish, put the. Okay. Okay. So. Um... Oh, go ahead. So you can see it's the same activity, but it's a different medium because there's a group online. And just um, parenthetically, you know, in reflection after where advice that I should have just had the in-person people using Jamboard also. Like she didn't need to actually go to the trouble of creating those papers. Um, yeah, they are actually using Jamboard. And those of you who have been following along Twitter or wherever else you get your information about EdTech, Google is actually phasing out Jamboard. Um, so Vi has a year to recreate that activity using a different um, whiteboard app. There are several other alternatives and stay tuned for more. We'll be able to share some information about alternatives. Um, yeah, it's, it's true, Kate. I know there's, it's such a great tool, but there are others. Fig Jam actually, yeah, Ashley likes that. I've heard pencil spaces is good too. And Miro is good. So there are, there are other things we can think about. So um, let's see, let's go on to another poll. Um, here, uh, you know, after what you've heard me talk about and seen a little bit of a clip in action, what do you think are some of the benefits of, of HyFlex? Um, I think we're doing so, the poll now, right? Uh, well, we'd love to have you just put it in the chat. Um, oh, put it in the chat, okay. Yeah, sorry about that for the confusion. No, that's okay, yeah, so throw some ideas in the chat. What are some of the benefits of HyFlex? Yeah, reaching more students, barriers, flexibility. Yeah. Any other idea? Yeah, student, it's access and barriers. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Different learning styles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Students maybe who are more, you know, more comfortable learning online, more comfortable working asynchronously, could definitely have opportunities to do that. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I guess then the next the next question is um we the so I mean we think for the field that um there are strong possibilities that it's gonna support attendance and because it supports attendance and flexibility, it'll support retention and course completion. And because learners are more engaged throughout their learning sequence and learning time span, we hope it possibly in increases opportunities for post-testing and noticing learning gains. Um, to date, there has been very little evidence um, about how it works. Um, we are still 
watching and gathering information from programs in ideal member states. Um, we actually just concluded a big um, data collection. We uh, uh, activity, we sent a survey out to all the states to find out how they define high flex. That's the first step because people are defining it differently. So we wanna know how people are defining it so we can then start to probe how it's actually working out with respect to um, learner persistence and, and level gains. Um, but we know we have a lot of independent teacher observations and we conducted um, interviews and created short case studies that you'll see um, in our guidebook that give some really interesting scenarios about how it can be beneficial in the teaching and learning process. Um, so stay tuned on more evidence, but we do have um, scenario based descriptions of, of it working in, in a range of settings. So um, next, I'm going to turn this over to Destiny, and she's going to give you a um, description of, of several resources that we have available for you to help you with learn more about HyFlex. Thanks, Jen. So we have three resources we wanted to highlight during the webinar today uh, to share with you as uh, items that might help you personally uh, explore HyFlex for your teaching, your program explore HyFlex, or um, if you're from a state entity to learn more about HyFlex as well too. So the first thing is the hybrid flexible instruction guide. And um, we also have a video series, which we'll talk about. And finally, a course that's available to states who are part of the Project Ideal Consortium, which we can mention again what that is um, when we get there. But the HyFlex guide is a resource that's available for free um, through ed tech books. We, uh, Jen and I co-authored this with David Rosen, and we did this through interviewing 17 teachers and administrators who uh, across the country who were uh, offering HyFlex. All of them started HyFlex during uh, 2020 or shortly after, and um, we're using it as a way to reach new learners and to make sure that uh, learners had access to um, participating in, in um, education. And so it's organized by these chapters here. We have uh, six chapters in addition to the vignettes that Jen was talking about. And um, I will just go here and give you a peek of what these look like. In writing this guide, we really wanted to try to make sure that it was very practical and meaningful and relevant to the work that you all did. Dr. Beattie's book is a great resource. However, his frame of reference and context is in higher education. So by interviewing programs, learning what they were doing, what was working and what was still challenging for them, we hope to give those that are starting with HyFlex or interested in learning more, a jump start on um, seeing how it works for adult education. And so each chapter is written to be very digestible. We uh, wrote it in a way that we hope that um, you're able to read through several chapters at one time. We included pictures, graphics, and images from real high flex classes in adult education. And we also included, as you can see, tons of links here so you can learn and explore more for items that you might be interested in. Um, I wanted to point out uh, these vignettes that Jen was talking about. One of the things that uh, you'll see here is for each program that participated in the, uh, in the interviews and the surveys that we did to learn more about this, uh, we uh, wrote a, a case study to kind of explain where they were, um, what HyFlex looked like, and um, also what successes and uh, challenges that they were seeing, um, as well as benefits for their learners and staff. One of the things that you'll note is that um, in addition to that, there's an appendix uh, for a HyFlex technology example, as well as some links to some uh, resources as well. So we'd love to hear, um, in going back, uh, to the slideshow, we'd love to hear and thinking about, these are the chapters that are here. What, um, and you can add this in the chat, what chapter do you feel like uh, you'd probably start with um, in looking at this book, which, which is an area that's of uh, interest to you? And you can uh, write that in the chat. So yeah, I see quite a few so far with instructional planning um, and the teaching sections. We try to incorporate as many real life examples as we could in the guide. Um, and as we do updates, well, I'm sure we'll continue to add more. 
Great. Yeah. So it seems like teaching and planning definitely are of interest to everyone. So we do hope that you'll consider reading the whole High Flex Guide as a whole. Like we said, we tried to write the chapters in, um, in a way that was uh, very relevant and um, uh, digestible and easy to read. Um, in addition to um, helping to do a frame of reference of as a program, what are some things you have to think about? Because in addition to um, instructional planning and teaching, of course, you'd have to think about technology. You might want to think about, okay, what does evaluation look like? And so we do hope you'll read all the chapters, um, but uh, it's great to hear that there's so much interest in the teaching and instructional planning sections. So great. Um, the funding section um, talks a little, we go into that a little bit into the implementing and scaling up HyFlex. So you'll, you'll see a little bit of notes in there um, as that as well. So thanks, Angela, for that comment. So we hope you will look at the guide. There's a link to it in the Padlet as well as the link to it in the chat, and we'll put the Padlet link in there again. I wanted to also share this HyFlex video series that we're doing. Uh, Vi Haas is an instructor at Pima College uh, Community College in Arizona, and she uh, recorded herself and her learners uh, demonstrating what a high flex class really looks like. So one of the things that we found um, in writing the guide and as you read it and in the vignettes is that high flex doesn't always look the same at every single program. Well, um, ideally the high flex programs in adult ed would have all three modes. It looked a little different in how each teacher as well as each program was delivering it. And so we wanted to give an idea for those that may be new to HyFlex, what does it even look like? How does this, how does this work in an adult ed program? Um, uh, and so these videos, we have five of them right now, um, are different uh, short videos that you could watch by yourself or as a group. We've heard of some programs watching them as a team and discussing them and uh, learn more about HyFlex together. So the first one is engaging all learners in the HyFlex class. And so that's one of the, uh, a snippet of the video that we watched together uh, during the webinar. We have a video, there was a request for, um, from several teachers about, well, what does it look like to even get your technology ready for your HyFlex class? And so that's one of the videos that you'll see of what Vi does for her technology. It may look different if you have different technology, but it'll at least give you an idea of just, okay, how, what does it look like before I start teaching my class? In addition to that, we have a video that talks about how to assess learning in the HyFlex class. How can you assess learning in all those three modes to make sure that you can have a sense of how learners are mastering the skills that you're teaching and if there's areas you need to review or what areas learners may have questions about. And finally, the last two videos are videos that share uh, just a tour of the technology that two programs are using. And so we're not necessarily endorsing that these are the best ways to use technology or the, certainly the only technology that's available for HyFlex. But we often find that a lot of times when programs are thinking about starting HyFlex, they have questions about what technology should I use and what does it even look like in my classroom? And so we wanted to go into real adult ed classrooms and uh, take a look at um, what's happening. So Christine Dreeling from St. Paul, Minnesota uh, gave us a tour. She is using um, a swivel um, for her HyFlex technology, which um, you can see here is uh, mounted on uh, that white base that has an iPad connected to it. And um, for Vi, you'll see uh, her tour of the technology that she uses, which includes portable speakers, a mounted um, kind of cam camera that's held, as well as a camera that's mounted onto her computer. So we'll talk a little bit about technology in, in a second, but um, we do want to highlight these videos as being great resources for you to check out um, and uh, something that uh, you can watch individually or as, uh, as a group and kind of discuss. So the last uh, resource I wanted to mention is a course that we developed uh, with, um, with Vi as one of the co-developers of this course. It's a HyFlex study circle. It's available for uh, states that are PD members of the Ideal Consortium. And the Ideal Consortium is a group of states that um, are members of uh, the group that looks and explores uh, different ways to 
um, integrate digital education into their technology. So we meet together in person or um, virtually uh, through an institute every year. And uh, this is one of the courses that uh, we developed this past year and piloted. It's a study circle where uh, learners will uh, go through the guide uh, together. Um, so teachers that are teaching HyFlex or will be teaching HyFlex soon, work through the guide, watch videos, they discuss, they make an action plan of something that they wanna try to do differently if they're already teaching or um, a plan if they're gonna start teaching and then implement that plan with support from each other. And so we had a great pilot this past spring, and um, it'll be available to uh, ideal uh, PD member states uh, right now this summer. So, um, and so uh, I see that there are some questions about the link. So I do want to just um, resend the Padlet link out to everyone. Um, this will be a great place to get a lot of the resources that uh, we're sharing today and the links to the guide and the video series, as well as some other resources that the EdTech Center puts out. So I'll put that link in the chat real quick here. And um, uh, let's spend some time talking about technology. So this is often one of the first areas that when programs or teachers are thinking about uh, offering high flex uh, is the technology. And so in writing the guide, we found that there was really a wide, wide uh, array of uh, technology that programs were using. Some programs started with two laptops. So one laptop for the teacher, one laptop that was pointed at the uh, in-person learners. Most of them quickly found that that wasn't a good enough solution in order to provide the online learners uh, uh, the same equivalent experience where they were able to hear uh, the same things that the in-person learners were doing. But there really still was a wide range um, from just kind of the basic technology that was needed versus high-end technology. You may have noticed in one of the um, snapshots in the guide of the picture, you know, there was one program that was co-located in a community college. And so they were able to have, you know, mounted cameras with speakers and microphones in their classroom. That was not the typical norm for um, most of our adult ed high flex classes that we interviewed and teachers programs. And so um, there really is a wide breadth. But if you're thinking about doing high flex, you first want to think about some of these considerations. And we, we go into this in more in depth in the guide. But you want to think about your purpose. Um, you know, what are, uh, why are you thinking about offering high flex? And who are the learners that you think would participate in a mode like this? You want to think about the learner's digital skills, you want to think about your learner's uh, access to technology and what uh, devices they might be using. But when you think about your physical classroom space, uh, you're going to want to think about, well, how big is my classroom? Um, because size of your classroom definitely matters. How are your how are your seats arranged in there? Are there is it one large table? Are there multiple tables? Does each learner have their own individual desk or space? Um, internet was a big issue for at least one program that we found where they found that their bandwidth wasn't strong enough to, to, to with their first solution to kind of offer high flex and getting additional bandwidth really wasn't possible where they were at. Um, and so they needed to switch technology in order to find something that worked better with um, having the live video conference happening during the class. You'll also want to think about your budget, because, of course, with adult ed, um, we want to think about what uh, what we can do with the means that we have in order to best serve our learners. Uh, keep in mind that the Digital Equity Act um, uh, states are currently planning in um, how they can use uh, federal funds in order to help support digital equity access and digital literacy skill building. So that could possibly be an opportunity in the coming years. But um, uh, the, your budget is obviously a very important uh, thing to consider as well. And often, if possible, um, we found from talking to programs, either going out to another program to kind of see what technology they use and get a sense of how that works. Um, if that's not possible, we have those videos available. And in addition to that, um, if there's a way you could pilot pilot some of uh, the technology first. So for example, I know one program borrowed an OWL camera from another program just to kind of see like, okay, does that even work for our space before they purchase something? And so those are all some considerations you want to keep in mind. 
At a minimum, though, the things that you want to um, make sure that you have are uh, a teacher. A teacher needs a computer or a laptop, and so most cases, what we found is in adult ed programs that existed already. Um, you're wanting you're going to want to have a camera that shows the teacher and also the in-person learners if possible. And so for some uh, programs, they use something like an owl camera or the swivel um, that uh, Christine was using in the YouTube video that we have. Or um, in other cases, what they used was a mounted webcam or the internal webcam for, uh, their, for their learners to see them. Um, in addition to that, you're going to want to make sure you have good microphones and speakers. So if any of you have ever done a hybrid conference or um, a hybrid meeting where you've been online and there's in-person people, if you can't hear what people are saying, that can make it uh, more challenging to really be engaged and to gather all the information that you need. And so making sure that you have a micro good microphones and speakers is really important. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to purchase the top of the line microphone and speakers. You'll see in the technology tour, Vi uses these little portable speakers that um, connect via USB to her computer and um, places two of them throughout the classroom. And that's how she picks up the sound for all the learners. So no matter where she is in the classroom, she's not like tied to um, talking right in front of her computer screen. She can walk around and support the in-person learners, but uh, her online learners can still hear her no matter where she is in the classroom. Um, and finally, you want to make sure that you have broadband internet connection because of the online video streaming that's happening. It's really important to have a good internet connection. In addition to that, um, for your remote learners, they would need some sort of device to log in and also broadband internet connection as well. So at this point, um, is anyone currently offering HyFlex? And uh, would you want to share what technology you're currently using or any lessons that you've learned um, in terms of picking technology, since we have quite a few people who are new to technology. And while I give you a minute to talk in the chat, I just wanted to highlight these two technology tours as well. Um, uh, so this is uh, Vi's classroom. You can see this is the camera she uses here. Um, so that shows the learners and the rest of the classroom. So she's walking around. And this is the camera here that shows her if she was behind her on her laptop. And this is uh, Christine showing the technology that she uses too. So I see there's a Zoom cart and definitely learners need to have a way to get um, access to the materials and students. So when you're thinking about HyFlex, it's not only the hardware that we're, uh, that's important to consider um, in terms of cameras, microphones, things like that, but also the software or tech ed tech tools that you might be using to help make sure that learners in all three modes are able to have access to learning materials that meets their needs. So for example, you saw that um, Vi was using Jamboard as a way to make sure that her learners both had a way to kind of manipulate the story, to put things in order, practice sequencing words, and things like that. So um, great. So uh, we do have a whole chapter in the handbook that's dedicated towards technology and um, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the hardware and educational software that we found programs were using. Um, so Wayne, thanks for sharing. Uh, it sounds like he's using a camera uh, similar to what Vi uses, the PTZ camera. And so, and you have a very large monitor in your class. So that's great as well too. Thanks for sharing that. So um, in thinking about the online um, and thinking about HyFlex and thinking about the three modes, teaching strategies are really important. And a lot of strategies that you're using, and we'll talk about a resource that kind of will show you how you can adapt them, but a lot of teaching strategies you're already using with your adult learners most likely can also be used in a high flex situation. You just have to think about it a little bit differently. And so one thing that Dr. Beattie recommends is that you start planning with the asynchronous learners first. So these learners that are not joining the live uh, class that's happening synchronously at the same time, but are either maybe watching a recording or working on um, vendor software or resources that you create. Uh, he recommends you start planning with those learners first because these learners could can often be um, the ones that uh, that uh, if you start with the in-class, um, the live class materials, that uh, those learners may not 
have as much uh, attention and focus on. And so he recommends starting with the online learners first. And then from there, um, uh, planning your lesson and thinking about how you can make sure you engage learners from all, uh, all three modes. And so uh, what we found in talking with uh, programs across the country that are doing this and with educators across the country that are using different tools. These were some of the common ones that we heard from learners um, or from educators. You know, having a class website or LMS is very important um, for your online learners as well as your asynchronous learners. And I would argue even your in-person learners, having that home space that's a place where they know they can always go to get the link to Zoom, to get the links that they're going to need for the class, to get the resources to um, maybe a curriculum that you're using that you're having them work on. That's so important, um, rather than just relying on email to send out links and asking learners to go through their emails to find everything. In addition to that, tools like Jamboard, um, Pear Deck, Pull Everywhere, which we use today, Google Docs, um, a lot of collaborative tools that allowed learners to really work together, either in small groups if they're online, um, small groups if they're in person, uh, individually if they're asynchronously, or asynchronous, or um, sometimes, as Jen was saying, um, having online learners collaborate with in-person learners. We heard of one or two programs that were doing that, and um, it was a great way for learners really to build relationships with each other and also to kind of connect uh, the learners together and make sure that there was uh, a whole classroom feel for, for everyone, which helps build trust and uh, comfort with sharing and learning together. So in addition to that, this is one of the shifts when we talk about uh, teaching strategies that you're already doing, how you might have to make shifts in how you're approaching the teaching. So for example, this is an activity where a teacher is conducting a think pair share. And in this example, um, if you were doing it in just one mode, you would just explain the directions. But as we saw in the video that high um, that we watched of Vi, there, um, you have to kind of make sure you're giving directions for all groups of learners. And so this is an example where the teacher says, you know, if you're in the room, I'd like you to turn to a partner and share what you wrote. If you're online, I'm going to assign you to a breakout room with two or three other classmates, and that's where you can share what you wrote together. And if you're watching the recording, so if you're having your asynchronous learners watch the recording, this is a great way to make them know that you're, they're not forgotten, and also make sure that they're engaged in the learning and that you're speaking to them as well, too. I'm going to ask you to pause, add your thoughts to the discussion form um, using the link below today's uh, recording, and then come back and press play when you're ready, and then we'll do a whole group debrief. And so uh, this is just one example for as a teacher, you just have to kind of shift and make sure that you're giving direction and um, attention to all three learning modes that you're doing. And at first, it may be kind of awkward, um, but I think what you'll find over time is that you start to get, it starts to become more routine, just like with anything that's new or different. The more times you do it, the more comfortable you'll get, the better you'll get, and eventually it'll just become kind of second nature. And so we do have those two chapters that we highlighted um, in the guide that um, seem like they would are of strong interest to everyone. And so we hope you'll definitely check out those and the resources that are there, in addition to reading all the sections of the guide. Um, another resource, though, we wanted to share with you um, is a teaching resource that was uh, shared with us. So this is from a different resource, and I'm just going to... Um, goes out of my screen here, uh, so out of the presentation. And so this is a resource that uh, is from a different HyFlex uh, website. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to us as a great teaching resource for those of you that are in the classroom and helping to kind of make that shift of like, okay, well, I know I have these learners in these different groups, but how do I get started? So these are some teaching strategies um, and techniques that you may already be using already. So for example, if you wanted to have learners create a pro-con list, um, what this does is when you click on this, it describes what it is. So this is great um, if you're uh, supporting new teachers who may be new to adult ed and don't have a background in education. This is also a great resource to help learners uh, sorry, help educators learn new strategies that they can add to their toolbox, uh, teaching toolbox. 
So it starts off with a description, some general directions of how to, but the thing that we really like about it is it shows, okay, how would you do this for your, here? How could you do this for your face-to-face -face learners? How could you do this for your online synchronous learners? And what does this, could this look like for your online asynchronous learners? And so there's probably a lot of variations for all these teaching strategies. Um, so for those of you that are more experienced, uh, you may find that this, um, you could quickly add to this. But for those of the of you that are either new to high flex or new to adult education, this is a great way to kind of see, okay, well, I wanna do a pro con list. How could I do it with all three modes of my learners to make sure they're engaged? So I'm gonna go back to my slides here. One second. So in our time interviewing with uh, programs uh, across the country and uh, writing this guide, we heard uh, some uh, tips really kind of repeat and resonate um, throughout the experience of writing the guide. And so some tips that we've gathered are, you know, really to try to start small and with early adopters. And that includes both teachers and learners. It's really important that learners also understand that this is a different way for them to participate in the class, that their teacher is going to have to, uh, you know, sometimes take uh, take some time to spend it with learners um, that are online, and so that they need to uh, be comfortable asking their peers for help or um, waiting until their teacher is able to get to them. And so uh, that's one of the um, tips that we heard uh, from many of the programs that we interviewed. In addition to that, um, we also heard that taking the time to identify the best technology for your class is really um, worth the time and effort up front to do. So there's so much technology and options that are out there, and there's so many variables that really affect what's the best one for you, that we found that it was important to um, programs found that they really benefited if they could try to think about, okay, uh, can I test out this technology some way? Can I see it in action some way, either by visiting another program or watching one of our videos? Um, uh, can I talk to the vendor and see like, okay, what's our bandwidth requirements? And uh, do we have enough internet to, to make that work? In addition to that, uh, this was also critical to plan enough PD time and plan and allow enough planning time for educators that were piloting high flex. So especially at first, just like we talked about earlier, when you're trying something new, it takes more time to do something because it's new. And um, it uh, and so teachers and you might need more support. And so it's really important to um, make sure that you allow enough time for um, your, if you're an administrator, to allow enough time for professional development and planning in order to help teachers uh, get ready and comfortable with teaching this, but also as they're still starting with the pilot of Hiveflix so that they can build their skills and learn as they go. Sharing, um, in some programs we found there might've been like two or three teachers that were doing it together and having time for them to work together in a professional learning community was a really valuable way for them to share and learn. In addition to that, ongoing tech support is needed both for teachers and learners. So you can see that um, for teachers, uh, as you're learning the new technology, uh, you'll need training and PD up front, but you may also have times whenever, I mean, it happens to all of us where we start up as something and it's not quite working the way we thought it would be. And so having tech support available was really important and also for learners. And if that tech support for learners while they're in class um, could be somebody else besides the teacher, whenever that's possible, that's always helpful. So some programs used um, a, volunteer, uh, a volunteer tutor or classroom aid in order to help provide some extra support. Some uh, programs, if you're in uh, Texas, for example, you're lucky enough to have a statewide call center that learners could access some extra support, but that tech support is really critical. Um, we talked about piloting the technology before, and you know, as with anything new, really expecting uncertainty and change is um, really important to go in with a growth mindset. Um, you know, thinking about how can we uh, 
pilot this experience? What can we learn from it? What can we learn to do better the next time or do differently? What's really working? And so that growth mindset we found was really important in um, helping teachers feel supported as they're doing this, helping learners feel supported as they were um, embarking on uh, participating in the HyFlex class, and also um, just really helping to uh, helping individuals just deal with the uncertainty and change that comes with trying something new. So I'm gonna put a link in um, again for the Padlet. This is a great way to get resources um, from uh, the presentation today, the guide, the link to the um, video series, as well as other great EdTech resources that are available. And at this point, we'd love to hear uh, what questions you have. We have some time here. There's a question about ELL's destiny. I would, I guess I would say the devised class was an, English, an ESL class. Um, and uh, but I, about half of the vignettes that we wrote about um, included ESL students. Um, I think that it's probably even more important to practice and make sure people are there in person early on if they're, if you anticipate having troubles communicating with them about technology as they're learning. Um, so that's maybe one recommendation. Destiny, do you have others? Yeah, so Haley, um, you know, you had mentioned about how to get the asynchronous students speaking because um, for language learning, we know how important it is to really practice uh, speaking and listening. And so um, Flip is uh, one video uh, way that you could have learners participate practicing and speaking. You could record yourself giving them a prompt and then they can record back. It doesn't provide that like live back and forth. You could see if asynchronous students um, partner with each other and have that practice time together as well, speaking and listening. Um, but uh, that's definitely something that technology can help to a certain extent. And then um, depending on uh, the where the learners levels are and what skill you're talking about, they may need to come to uh, join the online synchronous class or the in-person class at certain points too. Yeah, so Laura, you had mentioned that um, high-flex classrooms are really challenging to find substitute teachers for, and that definitely makes sense. Um, and so one, uh, some things that uh, we have actually didn't really have that come up while we were writing the guide, but just some ideas might be that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, everyone's doing an online online asynchronous piece for that, or um, the teacher is kind of sharing resources and activities that learners can do kind of independently um, while they're doing it. Um, so that if they're not able to come to an in-person class, because that's what you're able to find a sub for, that at least uh, there's still online asynchronous activities for learners to work on too. But that's a, a valid point. So can we, can we get a follow-up from Robin about funding limitations? Robin, can you say a little bit more or chat a little bit more? I don't know if you can unmute yourself. I'm wondering if this is a state policy thing. Sorry, Robin, can you try again? And while um, Robin's doing that, it's great to see, Angela, that you feel more comfortable um, and confident about this. We hope you check out our resources and that they help give you some ideas as well. Um, Kay, uh, if you put your email in the chat, I'd be happy to email you the links. So. Oh, uh, Robin, I guess she can unmute me. Yeah. In the I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if this has something to do with state policy around distance education. Um, I'm not sure that <laughs> um, essentially every state has their own policies around what is and is not allowable for distance education and the different modes of technology supported instruction. Um, so what I would suggest is maybe looking to your state level leaders 
to see um, what what's possible. Bottoms in the seats. Yeah, so different people, different states take attendance or account for time um, differently. In some states, the that live remote instruction is counted as in-person instruction, it's attendance, and in other states, it's considered distance, and so it's reported through proxy hour, um, whatever the policies are for proxy hours, um, they do it that way. So you just would need to look to your state distance education policy to find out how that's defined. And it looks like no one can copy the chat. Um, <laughs> So we're going to need a download of the chat so we know the email addresses to send links to. Yeah, or Bethel, I'm not sure if you have a list of everyone that registered that you have everyone's email address that we can just um, make sure that everyone has the resources. Um, what I will say is if you do have your cell phone with you, you can open up the camera app and um, scan this QR code that is... Um, that's here on the screen. And that will take you to um, pretty much all of the resources that I think we shared today. I'll make sure to add the, the teaching resource that has the online examples, the in-person examples and the online asynchronous. So, great. Um, we have time for a few more questions or if anyone's doing HyFlex, you know, we'd love to hear what's happening in your, in your classroom. So while um, we have some time, I do, I'll take a minute just to show you what is on this Padlet, just to highlight a few of the resources here. So um, you'll be able to access the guide, um, which is the um, guide that we were referencing throughout today. You can download that as PDF or read it online. This is the link to the five videos in our HyFlex video series. But some other resources are we've had uh, some lightning talks through our ed tech strategy session. A great one um, from an educator in Arizona that was sharing strategies for how their program supports learner engagement. It's a 20 minute video um, as well as this uh, technologies to implement HyFlex. They're both great videos that you could watch um, individually or as a group and kind of talk through that. We have some other resources related to our distance ed and blended learning handbook, a distance ed program development checklist, and a remote instruction observation tool that are resources available to you, and um, some ed tech uh, center resources we'd love to highlight, the ed tech strategy sessions, which are webinars that take place once a month. Uh, they're great ways to hear what's how educators and adult ed are using uh, digital education in, uh, with their learners and building uh, skills that they need for uh, the workplace and post-secondary ed. Um, the Ed Tech Strategy tool Toolkit uh, Digital Skills Library has uh, thousands of different activities and resources to build digital skills um, of our adult learners, and Crowd Ed Learning, which also has uh, great teaching activities for our learners. So I will go back to the QR code so you can access all of that. And we will send out an email with, um, with the links that we shared as well too. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Destiny, for being such a wealth of knowledge. It's always great working with you. And uh, we'll be on for another minute or so if anyone has questions. But thank you all for joining us. It was great to see uh, so many educators from across the country with us today. And we hope that these resources are valuable. We'd love to hear how you're using them um, or if there's any other needs that exist out there. So please feel free to reach out to us.
So that's all I think um, we could probably stop the recording now.